we're going to talk about automated model based testing of web applications and the title of this talk is slightly misleading because i'm going to talk a little bit in the beginning about testing event driven software and try to motivate the problem and then i'm going to tell you what we've done in terms of testing gui based applications so we've had lots of success in model based testing of gui based applications and then we will show you what we've done with web applications so the work on gui based testing is kind of a sneak preview of what we are going to do in the future for web applications okay all right so let's start with basic event driven systems or event driven software and this is my uh, abstract view of most event driven applications you have these event handlers that are coded and they're sitting in this cloud here and when the software starts executing each of these event handlers starts getting registered with a dispatcher and each event handler tells the dispatcher that i can handle a particular type of event or a particular class of events in a certain context and so each of them gets registered in this way and then the software goes into this state which i'm going to for the sake of simplicity just call s0 and now s0 is the collective state of all these event handlers and other things in the software that are important and the software is now in the state where it's waiting for events to come into the system so events start and e1 comes into the system the dispatcher knows that e capital e1 can handle this type of event and it uh, triggers this event handler the event handler handles the event and so things start moving the software state changes to s1 all right it's moved from s0 to s1 now if e small e1 comes again to the system it's quite possible that the dispatcher will decide to send another event handler that has registered itself to handle small e1 but in state s1 so you see that the execution when the software is going from state to state depends on the current state of the software and what the event handler has told the dispatcher what it can do so we are happily going along event e2 comes into the system and other another event is internally generated by e2 and we call this event e3 which needs to be handled so that gets handled by capital e3 and during this time the software has moved from s0 all the way to s3 okay uh in some cases as we all know that the execution environment in which the software is executing also has an impact on how the software runs and how the event handlers behave okay so let me just tell you how it is what a nightmare it is to test this kind of application so one thing one could do and one should do is to test or unit test each event handler all right so that's great but then because of this state based thing which james correctly said yesterday that that's a very bad thing uh you need to test each of these event handlers in multiple states and how do you get to these states is by generating or coming up with sequences of events preceding events to test this event handler all right so generating sequence of events is what we are actually interested in doing and those are our test cases uh we want to use model based testing techniques to generate these sequences and so what are the problems here the event interaction space to be tested is very large it's huge in fact number of test cases grows exponentially with length i'll talk a little bit more about this but when you have more events in the test case the total number of test cases can grow exponentially and we don't really know how to sample the space of all possible event interactions and when i say we it's not the two of us but we as a community don't know how to sample this large space of event interactions all right so let me try to put it in slightly more concrete terms uh, by giving you a small demo of this tool called computer management in under administrative tools of windows xp all right so i launched this tool and in computer in computer management local i am going to go and change and say 
connect to another computer. All right? So I am performing these sequence of events through the user interface. And the computer that I'm going to connect to, first of all, doesn't exist. And the name is going to be really long. Okay, So it's going to keep letting me type until it reaches a point where it doesn't let me type anymore. And then I say, OK. So as expected, I get this error message. So somebody really did a good job of uh, catching this kind of name. If I say OK, and I go to computer management and do a right click and want to view properties, then the application crashes. <laughs> So this is, um, I guess it's pretty funny. But <laughs> we would like to be able to generate such sequences automatically. As a tester, how do you come up with a sequence like this? All right. We want to be able to come up with models that allow us to generate these sequences in the thousands, maybe, and run them automatically on the application and catch these kinds of problems. All right, so I'm not going to send this to Microsoft. <laughs> All right. So we've done a lot of work with uh, GUI applications, and I'm going to tell you more about that. But web applications are also event-driven, right? We all know that you can perform events through the UI on the web application, and some event handler runs in the background. So this is, again, my abstract view of a web application and it being event driven. OK. Uh, there's a problem with this web application uh, where the state and the event handlers are distributed across multiple tiers. This is a problem that we have no not encountered before when we were looking at GUI applications. All right? So for example, in the presentation tier, which is, let's say it's on the client, you have some JavaScript event handlers that capture user events that are coming in and does something with it. All right. In the middle tier, you have all kinds of technologies where there are event handlers that receive events from the user's uh, layer and uh, process things. And then in the data tier, you have all kinds of data management events. Update the database. Re uh, retrieve something from the database. I call all of these things events. And lots of people write lots of test cases at all these different levels. So this is a nice test case to test the functionality that I had shown before. And there are test cases that you can write at the CGI level, uh, middle tier level, and at the database level. All right? Very complex applications. Uh, for example, if you think about database testing, it's extremely complex. It requires a lot of expertise. Uh, we are actually not really concerned about all of these tiers. What we care about is to test through the UI. Okay? We're not saying that uh, these other kinds of tests at the different tiers are unimportant. They're very important. But we would like to do automated testing through the UI. All right? So it's a different kind of testing that we are focusing on here. And by doing this, we would like to avoid some kinds of errors. For example, if I go to United Airlines, Anybody here from United Airlines? <laughs> All right. So I log in. This is my mileage plus number if you want to add miles to my <laughs> account. All right. Performance testing is very important for this. Um, also, there are lots of people who are on the wireless network, so maybe that's why it's slow. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Okay. All right. So let me tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> what is that? The, pr the problem with demos is that you have to really make put them in slides. You don't really want to have a live demo. All right, so uh, when I log in, United Airlines expects me to do certain actions. All right, it expects me that I expects me to perform some actions, do something in my account. All right, but if I log in and log out immediately, then this website doesn't know what to do. All right, so I log in and then I'm logging out. 
and it just gives it gives ends up in a blank page or it's something that the, it cannot access. All right, but if I did actions in the web application, I went and modified my profile, did lots of things, and then logged out, I would not see the same error. Okay, so the context in which an event is occurring seems to have a huge impact on how these applications behave, and this is not just web applications or GUI-based applications. There are lots of applications that have these characteristics. The context in which an event or an action occurs, let's say robot control systems, all right? The current state of the robot and the application really has an impact on how the events and the uh, commands behave. All right, so let's go back here. So this is what I want to do. I want to be able to obtain sequences of user events, either manually or using model-based techniques. <coughs> These sequences become test cases. And then I want to obtain the expected outcome, which is for a test oracle. This is something that determines whether the test case passed or failed. Execute the test case automatically and verify execution behavior. All right? The application that I showed you, the United Airlines application, is reasonably straightforward. Think about something like Google Maps where we are moving things around, zooming in, zooming out, the events that a user can perform on something like Google Maps is extremely complex. How do we do automated testing of that kind of application through the UI? Oh, so this is a topic that's going to be discussed at lunchtime, where the environment influences the accessibility of an application. So this is Federation of American Scientists website. If you're viewing it in Netscape 4.8, you cannot search. All right. If you're viewing it in Mozilla, then you are okay. All right. So this is a great. Uh, this is going to be a topic that we're discussing in, at lunchtime. So that's another thing that is a problem in web applications, where there are so many environments. Many of these ap web applications don't work correctly on my Windows mobile phone. All right. So what do people do? when they are trying to test things through the UI. So state of the practice, uh, manual testing is common. So as was mentioned yesterday, you hire a bunch of high school uh, interns, and then they give them some tasks, and they are happily uh, trying to th test the application through the user interface. Right? And at, after typing a little bit, you see that their head tilts. All right? <laughs> So the tilt of the head is very important because they're trying to verify whether whatever they did was correct or not. So that's the test oracle. It's a manual test oracle right now. All right. You come up with very few test cases. Of all the possible interactions that you have on the web application or on the GUI-based applications, there are millions and millions of them, right? Billions, actually. They are usually they're testing maybe hundreds of them because this is very expensive. So there are very few test cases that come up. Uh, it's valuable to do this, because humans can actually do very creative things when they're testing. Machines and models, they tend to be slightly dumber, I would think. Test Oracle is mostly visual. That's the tilt of the head. And then they, most of the time, people are testing common sequences. And I think we heard that yesterday in terms of game uh, testing games, that the, game, uh, the people who are testing games, are they want to do things that they like to do. So they don't want to go into that boat because the boat is boring. Right? So what is common? One person's common is another person's uncommon. And when we make applications, we always have some users like this. There will always be a bird brain who will want to do something to your application that breaks it. Whenever I've released an application, after a day, somebody will come back and say, that, look, I, I did this and I did this, and the application crashed. All right? So they'll always be there. And one of the biggest problems, I think, in my opinion, is that these test cases are not reusable. Okay? You must do this again when the application changes. Right? So that's one level of testing. There's another level, which is uh, coding tests. All right? So web driver tests. Go to google.com, type in something in the uh, query, and then hit the submit button. All right? A uh, web driver, you can uh, do this automatically. You can run things automatically. You can spread them across multiple machines. That's very nice. Uh, 
when you have regression testing, when the application evolves, then it's not clear what happens to many of these test cases. Depending on how the tests are coded and what kinds of changes are made, a lot of tests become unusable. So that's still a problem. Uh, Oracle, what do you check? What should you assert in this test case to see if your results are what you expect or not? That's still decided a lot by the tester. You still have very few test cases problem, right? How many test cases like this can you code? It's, it's still a few. All right, and then there there's a little known tool called Selenium that also does some of this. All right, um, okay, so thanks Scott for this test case. All right, so another thing we can do is to start using capture replay tools. So the thing is that all of these people and the bird brain, whatever they're doing is useful, all right? So we capture all of this using a tool and store it in a database or a test file and there are several tools that allow you to do this. For example, the well-known tool Selenium IDE, they, it allows you to capture and replay. Uh, the tester manually performs the actions, the tool captures it, stores it, and also some partial state that is specified by the tester is also stored. All right? And when you want to replay it, you give it to a soft bot that can take the test file and then replay and then check against what has been stored. Okay, so these are good tools. They do a lot of uh, good things. Uh, and that's why we have also used some capture replay tools in our own work. So this is where we think the state of the world is. All right? I consider these to be reasonably solved problems. They are very smart people working on these things. Uh, so we don't need more, less smart people working on the, them. Right. So tests can be replayed automatically. You can spread them across multiple servers. You can run tests in multiple browsers and platforms. Um, you have good test management. Some of these tools actually have very good test management. And you can vary data for test cases. For example, you can read things from a database, fit them in text fields. These are the problems that persist, some of them that are going to appear on the right-hand side. How do you sample the space of all possible event interactions? This is something that we don't understand yet. We need more people to do research in this. We need experiments. We need results of experiments that can tell us that there are certain kinds of sequences that are important, that should be generated. When the web application evolves, what do you do? Lots of these sequence-based test cases become unusable. What do you check? And then there is this more philosophical question that how do you test large event-driven applications. This is not just specific to web. If you have solutions for the web, then we should look at how it can be migrated to other kinds of event-driven applications. So our approach is take the capture replay tool because they are well engineered and they have good test management and they've done lots of work in terms of intercepting uh, mouse events and things like that and split it apart into the capture part and the replay part and insert a model in the middle. All right. So a web application model, what does it look like? For, this is my favorite picture of a model. A model should have some red nodes and some lines in there. All right. So for example, I could think of this as a state machine model. Right. Each of these red nodes becomes a state and this is a state transition that leads from one state to the other. All right. If I have usage profiles of how users are using my web application, I could probably fit some probabilities on this state machine model, come up with a probabilistic state machine model, all right? use that model to maybe generate test cases that mimic the population of users who were used to capture those profiles. All right? So we have done some of this for uh, our applications. If I had for each event that you can perform on the application, if I had preconditions and effects, maybe derived from the specifications, for example, something that looks like this, for a zoom in uh, event, which takes two parameters, the window and the map that's being displayed, if the window that is uh, being displayed is a current window, and the current zoom, if I can obtain that, and it's not equal to the max zoom, then I can execute this command called zoom in. I can zoom into my map, all right? And the effect is that the value of the current zoom will increase. If I can encode certain things like this for each event that a user can perform, 
then I can use this to build my test oracle, which can be used to verify if a test case executed correctly or not. Or we have used AI planning for test case generation. Right? So a planner will give you a sequence of events that you can replay automatically on the uh, user interface or on a web application. I'm going to talk a little bit about event flow graphs that we have uh, developed for this kind of work. Uh, so I'm not going to say much about them here. We have also used the dynamic behavior of the application to generate additional test cases. All right? So what the philosophy here is that don't generate thousands of test cases and dump them on the machine. All right? Generate a few, execute them, learn something from those results, and then improve your testing. So run test cases in batches. So that's one thing that I'm also going to talk about. And so we've done this for desktop applications. And for web applications, we're going to talk a little bit today about the state machine model that we've used to generate test cases. All right? So most of this stuff is uh, done for GUI desktop applications. But this is something that we're going to migrate to web applications. That's why I want to give you a sneak preview of what we have done for GUIs. And the idea is that you guys have lots of uh, experience with web applications. We, I would like to hear from you what you think about this migration. Right? So as the talk progresses, by the end of it, I think you'll have enough background so that maybe you can give some useful insights. So this is our sneak preview on what we want to do for web applications based on our past work on GUI-based applications. So first thing is the event flow graph. The event flow graph was one of the most important models that we came up with for our work. So what is an event flow graph? Those of you who were here last year might, might, might remember some of this stuff. Uh, the first thing we do is we identify all the events that a user can execute on the application. All right? So usually, for a GUI-based application, all the widgets, menus, uh, drag and drop events, those kinds of events are identified. Okay? And then we come up with this relationship called the follows relationship, which says that a user can perform this event after performing this event. All right? So it gives you a blueprint of how a user can use the application. It has a flavor of program flow graphs, data flow graphs to some extent. We call these event flow graphs. All right? Now what is this again? This, the nodes here are events that the user can perform. They're not states. And the relationship here that's being shown is that a user can perform this event that's at the end of this arrow and uh, after performing this event immediately. All right? So this gives you a whole uh, blueprint of what a user can do on this application. Okay? So that's an event flow graph. Then we, in our experiments, we have run literally millions of test cases. We have studied their results. And we have found that there are certain patterns of GUI events that lead to effective fault detection in applications. All right? So if you generate these sequences that have been shown to be effective in the past, then you get really good test cases. So that, those experiments have led to another structure called the event interaction graph, which abstracts out certain events, resulting in smaller graphs that are more eff efficient for us to process. So I'm not going to go into too much detail of that. But just remember that this is now an event interaction graph where this edge is a path from this event to this other event. And maybe there's an intermediate event that is needed to get from here to here. Right? So there's a slight difference between event interaction graph and event flow graph. I can take questions offline after the talk if you are more interested in that. So this is our event interaction graph. Right? Now let's say that we want to do something really straightforward. These are the events that are available to you when the software is first launched. Okay? So let's say you launch Microsoft Word. What are all the events that you can perform immediately in Microsoft Word? These are the ones that have these incoming arrows. Now with these incoming arrows, I can start from this node, and I can follow these arrows. And at each event that I encounter, I can spit that out into a file. And that gives me a whole test case. If I do this random walk, I get all kinds of test cases that probably mim mimic that uh, bird that I showed you, like typing random things. Or I can do slightly better. 
And since I have this structure, I can generate what I call two-way covering test cases by picking each edge in this event flow graph. And for each edge, I generate a test case. All right? so, for, so for example, I picked this edge, and I took these two adjacent events. And then I f used the shortest path algorithm from this node to this node to get me a full test case. And then because this is an event interaction graph, some of the events are missing, so I fit those, and I get a full test case that I can give to a robot that can replay it automatically. Okay. So that's kind of how we could generate test cases from event interaction graphs. Okay. So this is a very promising technology. We've had lots of success for GUIs, and I think for web user interfaces that are becoming more like uh, GUIs, like for example with AJAX technology, we feel that this is very promising for that kind of work. All right, so how do you create event flow graphs? Event flow graphs are nice, but they can be pretty large. For example, if I show you three windows in Microsoft WordPad, uh, don't worry if you cannot read this. This is kind of blurred on purpose. But this is the pull down menu of WordPad in the main window. There's the find window and the replace window. And if I want to have an event flow graph for, this in, for these three windows only, then it looks something like this. All right? So it's a mess. All right? And nobody's going to do this. Even my graduate students will not do this. All right? So, so how do we come up with an event flow graph? What we did was we came up with an automatic uh, technique to extract the event flow graph from an application or an approximation of an event flow graph. All right? That would help us save a lot of time. So the technique that we came up with was called GUI ripping. We rip the event flow graph from the GUI. Okay? And the key idea is that if you give me the handle to the first window of your application, I essentially do a depth first traversal of the entire window hierarchy. And I extract all the widgets that are available to me. And from this uh, GUI tree, I use uh, an algorithm to convert everything to an event flow graph. Okay? That's a paper. I can give you a copy of that. I can discuss it if you need. Uh, we don't have time to go through that. But the idea is that we want to use similar techniques for web applications. Can we extract the usage structure from a web application? And you'll see that a little bit in a demo today. OK, so the, we can obtain event flow graph for large GUIs in a few minutes. In fact, one of my students is working on uh, GUI ripping uh, for uh, Microsoft uh, Office. And he's able to do Microsoft Word. He's able to obtain 40 or so windows in Microsoft Word with 1,000 or so widgets in roughly 20 minutes. So that technology, he's still working on that. And so we are hoping that we can apply some of these techniques to Microsoft Word at some point. And then we can automatically transform the event flow graph to an event interaction graph using heuristics. Okay? So there's a slight uh, problem here. Since this is a fully automatic process, what it yields is an approximation of the event flow graph. There are parts of the GUI that might be missing in what we can obtain automatically. Right? So we have an editing tool where the user can actually go and add stuff to the event flow graph. The user can open a window that we've missed and tell our tool that add this window to the event flow graph structure. So it can do that. So we can stitch event flow graphs together. Uh, there are parts where the relationship is not always accurate. Okay, because of state-based things that we cannot capture using automatic techniques. The, how you can go from one state to another? What states are valid? Can you go from not entering any username or text box to the next page in the, in the application or not? Is that valid? Is that not valid? And that would drive like how the uh, test cases are generated. So I'm going to show a table for you representing this web page. So, S index, all, this, all the states here uh, are yellow. They are the start states. So this S index is when you first load the login page. Um, you can click. These are the transitions that you can go to valid transitions from this web page, from, uh, from this particular state. So I can click on the reset button. And these states right here in, I guess, red or something, right here, they would, they would be the, the, the end states. So if I click on reset, I'm still going to be in the, the current state that I am. If I enter a username text, but I'm in this state, 
if I enter if I enter a password, I'm in this state. I can't go from nothing to suddenly entering username and password, so this is not a valid state. And so on and so forth. And we do this for the entire for all the different for all the different elements uh, on the on that web page. So I'm gonna go back to the demo. So, so after we've generated the table manually, then we, we, we come up with, using WebDriver, we say, okay, um, what would represent a start state? So the idea is that once you load the page, um, what are the elements that are on the page as soon as you load them? All the links, all the uh, text boxes and buttons and everything like that, we store them and their values as soon as the page is loaded. So that way we have a way of keeping track of the states of, the, of our website as we go along. So we'll be able to verify, okay, our, is our test giving the right results? And we do the same for events as well. So each state would be a list of, I guess, the values of all the text boxes and the buttons and things like that. And the events would be, okay, click or enter text and things like that. And then we came up with some kind of uh, like a, a translator that converts this table into ASML code, which is which was created by Microsoft uh, Research. And uh, we basically we use Spec Explorer, which is a portion of ASML code, as I understand it, um, to model the diagram, the state model that I showed earlier on with all the arrows and things like that. So so that uh, we're able to store and keep track of things as we go along, and then. Um, it also we're also able to get um, we're also able to convert the um, to convert our state machine model into you could also uh, uh, show that graphically using Graphviz, which is uh, just a graphical representation tool. And then after you've done all this, then the user verifies uh, the all the test cases that came forth from this. And so you can know, okay, did your test uh, pass or did it fail? So, um, so right, so now we have our uh, ASML code, which basically represents our state model, like all the transitions and all the states that are possible. And we also have what they represent using in WebDriver code, like the events and the states. And then we came up with a, an automatic event sequence generator, which basically converts our state model, traverses it, and comes up with a, a list, like a tree of event sequences and the different states as you go along. Um, and I show, again, I showed the, the graphical representation. So these two are then combined using uh, a web driver command generator, which basically converts all these, all these states and the transitions and um, converts them into web driver commands. And then we come up with different uh, web driver test cases. Oops, excuse me. All right. Um, so the algorithm that we use to traverse the state machine model. I'm not going to read this because I don't want to read it and nobody wants to read this. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to go through this. Uh, I came up with this little graphical uh, representation. So we're here, we're starting at the start state. This is our, our um, this is the first state in the model. So what the algorithm basically says is it's basically a death first start algorithm of the entire state model. So we look at all the outgoing transitions from this state. Like, what are the things that we can perform in this state? What are the valid things that we can perform? I can enter a password in the, t in the password text box. I can enter a username. I can click the reset button. So let's say, so we pick one of them. So okay, is there any that we haven't uh, picked? Is there any that we haven't traversed? And we click and we take that path, right? So we start state. We start from here. We take this transition, and we're in this state. From this state, we, we also say, okay, uh, what are the transi outgoing transitions from here? What are the valid actions that I can take from here? Um, I can click on the submit button, which should give me an error because I don't have a, uh, a username. It, I could click on the reset button, which clears the form, uh, or I can enter a username. So we click, we select one. 
And we keep doing the same thing. From here, I can go here, or click on the Submit button. When we reach a state that has, that has no algorithm transitions, this main and HTML basically represents, okay, that means you successfully submitted the form and the next page in the web page uh, uh, has loaded. So when we reach a state, there's no algorithm transitions from here, so we backtrack. And we say, okay, what are the other transitions that we have not taken from this? And we pick one of them. And we keep doing that to, until all state pairs and all transitions have been taken. And as we're going along, we're generating test cases. So we have some short test cases, which lead to the, to the final, because the, the aim of the login page is to get you to the next page in the web application. So that's the idea, and we keep doing this until all uh, transitions in all states. So basically, it's, it, it, it helps, lets you cover all the possible user actions that people could do on your web page. So I'm going to uh, demo the tool real quick. So what it's going to do is it's going to, I hope it's going to load the web browser and the performance. It's going to, so right now it's generating the different event sequences and, and, and uh, states that you could um, go through. There we go. Okay. So it's loading the web page. It's going to enter a username. Um, click reset first. Nothing happens. That's fine. Enter a username. Click the reset button. Clears everything. Enter the username again, enters the password, it's going to clear out the password, and click on the enter password again, click on the submit button. So all this is done automatically, and it's basically just all the test cases, sequences that were generated is basically um, just testing each and every one of them. So now I'm going to show you. Ooh. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> okay. Ooh. All right. So here are the uh, web driver codes that's generated. I can show you. Try to show you real quick. The some of the event sequences. Okay. Here we go. Here's one. So enter. You have a reset button. Um, excuse me. From this state, you can click on the submit button. It's not valid. So these states, and, 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 the, t and the tool verifies as it goes along to make so that you would know where there was an error, where your uh, web application crashed. All right. So, um, so we've automated gen test case generation. The other part that is manual is the creating of the tables. And so we worked on trying to automate that as well. Um, so we have a, a web ripper, which is the web version of the GUI that Professor Mohan talked about. And it's basically the first thing that happens when you load the web page is that, like I said, it will like it will um, collect all the it was it will scan the web page and collect all the user um, all the user elements, I guess, like actions like text boxes, and, and it'll store them in a tree. And, and those will comprise of what a state is. And, those, and as those values change, as you perform different actions on the web page, you keep verifying with all those, all those, all those um, uh, elements of the web page. So that, that, that's the definition of the state. And so um, we, we perform like a breath rest search of all the, all the different um, combinations of events that you could have. So you have, so let's say I have two, two, uh, two text boxes and two buttons. I could click on it, I could enter a text in the text box and then go from there and enter text in the other text box and then click on the submit button. So all these different um, event sequences, so to speak, are going to be automatically generated. Now some of them do not make sense. And, the, and that's where the tester is going to have to go back and um, basically update the table that's generated. Now, okay, so the table that's generated is going to be in XML format. Um, 
So it's going to load the web page, scan everything, do the traversal. I should close the web page when it's done. OK. And so now we have this table, which basically represents the table that we had in the beginning. And all the user has to do now is just indicate which, st which states. We have this start state uh, called initial state. Is it initial state? You enter true or false, and you keep doing that. And all the end states, can you go from this state to this state? If you can, you enter an action. You give, an, give a text. This, and you keep editing as you go along. And the idea is that it's easier for you to have this huge list and decide, OK, what, what do I need and what don't I need, as opposed to trying to come up with all these different um, test cases. So, and this is the exact same table that we had here, only in XML format. And that's converted uh, into, in the tool as well. So I'm going to hand back over to uh, Professor Mamon to finish up. Does this work? Oh, oh okay. yes. Uh, no, I'm fine. All right, so let me just uh, summarize what we've been doing. Uh, we showed you a state machine model, and we're trying to create a web ripper that will come up with the state machine model approximation automatically. And then we're coming up with tools that the user, the tester can use to edit the state machine model, and then use existing <laughs> tools to generate test cases and run them automatically. Uh, the, there are lots and lots of limitations of what we've done so far. And as you can see, the application that we showed you is very straightforward. I'm sure if you add more complexity to it, the reverse engineering and the web ripping will not really work fully. Uh, that's why we would like to actually hear from you. Uh, so we want to en enhance and extend the model. We want to come up with new state machine traversal strategies. What uh, Shay showed you right now was basically uh, you want to cover all pairs of uh, states. And then we want to evaluate using experiments how good our new test cases are. Uh, there are limitations in terms of what we can extract. And there is lots and lots of work that we want to do by extending our GUI testing stuff. Uh, there, are, there is probably time for some questions and some discussion. But the question that I have for you is, how do we test this kind of an application, which is so much more complex than what we showed you? for which I don't even know how a state machine can be created. Have you considered a, uh, a framework for doing all the plug-in validation stuff for each state transition, such that you can make it flexible? For instance, a time-based time <coughs> validation. For instance, if this state transition, or for instance, if a, if a request doesn't come back within a certain period of time, you can consider that a failure, et cetera? OK. So the question is that, have we considered adding some more uh, verification elements to our test case? Or making it, making it uh, user pluginable. User pluginable, yes. So uh, right now what happens is, as each uh, see event sequence is generated, after an event, we do verify using WebDriver code whether we have reached the right state. But a user can definitely go in and insert <coughs> things in there. It, it becomes a Java program in the end. So then you can insert things on your own, yes. Very interested in this area, uh, but I have lots of questions. But one of them is like for web testing, in particular, if you add a few more nodes in your graph, you can have explosion of test cases, right? Yes. Uh, the problem there is that uh, web based testing uses Ajax, uses JavaScript, and then actually in one test case, it might take, uh, you know, three, five, ten seconds, right? Right. So it's going to take you two light years to execute this test case, right? Yes. Uh, and I heard about this pairwise, pairwise uh, uh, algorithm reduces the, the amount of test cases. Is that something similar to what you talked about, the pair, the nodes? And the right. So, so one of the things is that, of course, the, uh, we expect that the state machines and any, for example, an event flow graph for a web will be huge. What it helps us in doing is, it helps us in generating many, many test cases. As you said, it might take us two light years to run them. But we have lots of machines. Right now, we have over 1,200 machines on which we spread our test cases. We have a cluster, a condor cluster that also does that. But it helps us to study these results. So we don't expect testers to actually use this and say that they're going to automate their testing process. But what we want to do is to take the next step in understanding these event sequences so that at the end of the day, we can come back and tell you that these are the interesting kinds of test cases that you should be generating 
because we've shown them to uh, detect more faults than others. Okay, so it's a kind of an experimental platform for us too. Right. So the, uh, it's more of a suggestion that uh, uh, how do you make web applications more testable, more test friendly, for example. For example, now uh, the latest version of Microsoft Office has all these kinds of things that help us to test it. Uh, oh. So similarly, web applications, they could probably do the same thing. Yes. Uh, maybe we have one more uh, question. Yes. So that's a good question. So how do we get the data into our test cases, right? Uh, and once you start getting into all kinds of data that can go into these text fields, then the state space will explode. And we have the same problem in GUIs. But what we have been able to do so far is that we use the good old category partition method on each text field, come up with constraints between field elements, and then populate a database, which is read at uh, test execution time. And so they get plugged in. So we have a limit on how many we can plug in. But this is a big problem that we still haven't solved. That's a good question. All right. I can take other questions offline, because the other speaker is, uh, I would say, ready. Right? Done? Thank you.